So hello, everybody. My name is Jennifer Ho. I am director of the Center for Humanities and the Arts, which is one of the co-sponsors of today's Race in the Railroad event, along with Center of American West. Um, Tamar, would you like to, this is Tamar, um, the executive director, and is Tom Zeiler here, I think? No, not yet. Okay, Tom will show up at some point. Um, and then Julie Carr, also, who is chair of Women and Gender Studies, professor in English, and the English department is also co-sponsor, and I see um, some familiar faces um, from the English department and English majors in the room, so that's really wonderful. So I'm going to give you the spiel I gave just about eight minutes ago, so for people, people here eight minutes ago, you can pretend I didn't say this. Um, so I teach a course, Introduction to Social Justice. I'm seeing many of my students in the classroom. Hello, students. And at the beginning of the semester, I knew, because I had returning students who were immune compromised, that there were students who would be very uncomfortable being in the classroom um, if everybody wasn't wearing masks. And there is no mask mandate. It is not required for anyone to wear a mask. But I was instructed um, by the COO of the university that I could request. It was, it was allowable for me as both a faculty member and a director to request. And so I am making this request. That if you feel comfortable, if after what I've said to you, you think you might want a mask because I have immune compromised students who may be in this classroom, um, people who live with immune compromised people, um, and because quite frankly, wearing a mask is one of the public health measures that we can take in terms of the spread of COVID-19, in terms of the flu, in terms of a number of things. We have masks in the back of the room. I would invite people to please you know, get a mask. We have staff who can pass around the box of masks. Thank you very much. Um, so this event is going to be recorded if you have friends who are unable to come and you would like um, to direct them to the recording. That's really wonderful. I'm going to read a brief introduction um, for our guests, but I think the idea is for there to be an organic conversation um, between our two guests and that I will not really be part of that conversation unless they force me into it. Um, and then we will turn to question and answer from all of you. We've gotten three pre-submitted questions. Um, so we might start with the pre-submitted questions and then um, also uh, ask any of you to also ask questions. So without further ado, um, I'm going to start in alphabetical order um, with Professor Julia Lee who is professor and chair of Asian American studies at UC Irvine, where she teaches courses on Asian American literature, race, and urban space, Asian American communities, and Asian American popular culture. She is the author of Interracial Encounters, Reciprocal Representations in African American and Asian American Literatures, 1896 to 1937, Understanding Maxine Hong Kingston, and then most recently, The Racial Railroad. And I will show you her book which is fantastic. You can get it at NYU Press. Um, and on our website, there's a direct link, so you can get, you can buy it. Um, Julia didn't know I was gonna say any of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she's published several essays and articles on Asian American literary studies. Her current research focuses on an emerging subgenre of contemporary Asian American literature that she's tentatively calling the Asian American neo-frontier narrative. These works portray the stories of Asian American or Asian diasporic characters as they move across the spaces of the 19th century American West, ones that index the difficulty, if not impossibility, of an Asian American past that coheres with history as it is legitimized by institutionalized structures of memorialization, such as archives. Next, we have Paisley Rectal, who's a distinguished professor of English at the University of Utah, a poet who's published several works, won several prizes and distinctions, including serving as the guest editor of Best American Poetry of 2020. Um, she's an essayist who's published several notable books, such as Intimate, Appropriate, A Provocation, and the work with the best title ever, The Night My Mother Met Bruce Lee, Observations on Not Fitting In. That was my entry into reading um, all of the poems and creative nonfiction of Paisley Rectal. She's the creator and managing editor for the web archive of Utah writers, Mapping Literary Utah, and also Mapping Salt Lake City, a community written Happy web Wednesday. atlas. Okay. Um, that maps the various communities and neighborhoods of Salt Lake City through critical and creative literature, interactive maps, and multimedia projects. And she has recently sat down as the poet laureate of the state of Utah, where she was commissioned to write a piece commemorating 
the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad, which we'll be showing portions of on the screen. It's called West, a translation. So um, you can get to the link from the Center um, of American West website and the Center of Humanities and the Arts website. Um, so let me tell you why Julia and Paisley are here today. So their works came out roughly around the same time in last in the spring, in the spring. And I was immediately captivated by both. I actually got page proofs of Julia's book. Um, and then I saw Paisley, I, it must have been social media that I saw a reference to Wes. And I, because I had read both of them together, I thought they're really works that speak to each other. And what I really wanted to know was what each of them thought of each other's work. And because I direct a humanity center, I thought, oh, I could actually just invite them to come and get to hear them talk about really spectacular, brilliant, thought-provoking, rich things regarding the railroad, race, settler colonialism, a host of factors. So um, maybe to start us off on the conversation portion, and I'll sit down for this, um, two questions to start you off with. What's your first memory of riding on a train? And I will let you define train however you want. <laughs> and then why, why the railroad? Like what interests you kind of creatively and intellectually about the railroad? I was hoping you'd go first because, uh, well, for me, I, I can't really remember my first memory of being on a train, which is really strange. But um, when I was living in Europe, you just take trains all the time. And then mm -hmm. when I was in Asia too, taking trains all the time. Um, but for me, my, my interest in the, the railroad was simply a commission. It was a grant. I mean, someone asked me to be interested in it. And so to a certain extent, I'd never thought about the railroad at all. And it wasn't until I started researching and thinking about the 19th century and what the railroad symbolically meant to us as a culture and, and what it practically meant to people and how it just upended so many aspects of culture, I couldn't not be fascinated by it. So, but I was given that task. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious about you because yeah. you generated that task. So right. what, what first drew you? I, I also have no memory. I don't know when I rode the railroad. I, I have yeah. a vague memory of being in Korea and traveling with my parents on the train. But honestly, I mentioned this in the acknowledgments of my book. Uh, my parents immigrated to the United States in 1975. And one of my father's hobbies was model railroading. Mm -hmm. So we had a very amateur, uh, very basic kind of railroad setup in our basement. And um, many of my father's extra sort of outside interests were about assimilating into US culture. So he was a big hockey fan. Um, he was a big football fan and he was into, he was into the railroad. Um, and so my memories of him all around, um, like watching football games, watching hockey games. We lived in Buffalo, New York. So that was, that was like a big deal in Western New York. And then taking these trips um, at night in the cold, begging to go to this railroad shop where he would pick up his models. Um, he left us in the running car. It, it was a different time. It was the seventies. You could do stuff like that. So we never went into the store, but we were allowed to play with the, with the trains once he purchased them. So it's not a memory of riding the railroad, but it, I think speaks to kind of, he saw it as an avenue for, you know, um, feeling, you know, more welcome in the country where he'd moved. Um, that had nothing to do with why I'm interested in the railroad. It's just something I realized later. But um, what interests me about the railroad is basically it's everywhere and nowhere yeah. at the same time. So nobody, I mean, very few of us, I think in our everyday lives, ride the train as part of our everyday lives, right? It's, it's kind of a novelty thing, I think for most of us. Um, on a trip, you take a day trip or something, or you talk about riding Amtrak or something. Um, but the train is everywhere in sort of cultural representations in the United States, like to this day. And what I find interesting about that is it's, it, 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 it's understandable why you have representations of the railroad in the 19th century and early 20th century when lots of people were riding it. Rail ridership in the US, I think the golden age of railroad travel is the early 20th century. Um, millions, millions and millions of people riding the trains every day. So it's understandable 
that train riding is a part of kind of cultural representation, right? It doesn't make as much sense to me, like in the 20th century, as people start riding cars and planes, why you still keep seeing um, depictions of the railroad in popular culture, visual culture, literary culture. So I'm sure right now between all of us, we could come up with hundreds of examples of things, TV shows, photographs, um, songs, um, you know, novels, short stories, like it's, it's just everywhere. And so, um, and in those representations, I'm a scholar of, of race and ethnicity, I would, it, it keeps coming up as well, questions about racial identity, right? Questions about um, interracial friendships or interracial conflicts. And so what is it about the train that kind of invites that sort of representation as well? Um, so that is really, it's like this contradiction that I was trying to explain. Why is the train everywhere and nowhere at the same time? Um, and that's really the, the kind of the, the source of the book. You know, what you just said is so interesting to me because that was the first thing I was thinking of as well when I approached, when I was asked to write a poem about the Transcontinental mm -hmm. Railroad mm -hmm. for its 150th anniversary, its completion in Utah, right. where I was Utah's poet laureate at the time. Right. Um, and I'm half Chinese and I was explaining this, you know, and I don't necessarily read that way to a lot of people, but I wanted to center the Chinese right. experience with that. But when I started thinking about what the train symbolically meant that everywhere and nowhere really works. I mean, that the ways in which the train from its very origins was understood as a metaphor, as much as a yes. physical construct, yes. that it was a way of unite. Lincoln said, this is a way of reuniting <clears throat> the country after brother, after brother, mm -hmm. brother versus brother had been fighting in the civil war. Right. It was understood as an assimilation project, yes. even from like Emerson and you know Thoreau immediately understood mm -hmm. it is a, uh, both a divisive and a connecting um, technology, uh, and people really sort of saw it as part of becoming American. That's right. And I really loved the idea, in some ways, as a poet writing about uh, the transcontinental. I was also laying down another sleeper in the sentence of this railroad. Yeah, you know, I was just as much constructing the railroad. Um, in some ways, because we keep going back to it. Yeah. And um, I experienced this sort of perverse little thrill like a few months back, maybe you were too, when um, there was going to be a railroad strike. Yeah. And suddenly the entire country was like, oh, wow. Yeah, everyone took a pause and they were like, it's everywhere and nowhere. But right. if the railroad shuts down for anything, there's this cascade effect that would affect every single person That's right. in the country. And so it is this, this spine that metaphorically continues on, mm -hmm. um, but then also economically has real impact on, on us on a constant level. Yeah. I think spatially too, when I say it's everywhere and nowhere, like you all know probably in your daily commute where the railroad tracks are, where railroad mm -hmm. crossings are, right? You know, you have to stop, you know, and you're hoping, oh, I hope I don't get caught behind it, you know? So, but it's not something it's informing like your movement through your lives, but it's not something you're thinking about consciously yeah. or even aware that you know, right? Um, so yeah, so that's just one example. Yeah, right? and it also divides cities. That's right. Segregation, you know, in that kind of sense too, where we're thinking about on the other side of the track, mm -hmm. um, the ways in which certain certain people living in neighborhoods on one side of the track versus the other would that's still right. persist to this day, at least right. in Salt Lake where I'm from. Um, and, you know, in your book, you talk about time, too. Right. It, it changes our notion. It changed our notion of time, right. um, you know, from a very practical standpoint, so we don't get into train crashes with each other. We divide up the, you know, the country into four different time zones, right. so we know when these trains are leaving. But the idea that, that the railroad itself becomes a space out of time, which right. I think, you know, as different people entered into the train, they entered into different relationships with each other. And mm -hmm. I thought that was what was so fascinating to me about writing about um, the train and also what you pick up in your book, yeah. which is as soon as you get these people who are segregated by sex, by class, by race outside of the train, but then they're all riding the train at the same time. Right. Suddenly these questions of like who people are That's right. and how, you know, how they get classified. Are you white? Or are you not white? The story that really fascinated me, fascinated me was Ida B. Wells getting mm -hmm. kicked off the train. Um, African American women, um, in the very first sort of days of the, you know, railroad travel and the transcontinental, they understood very quickly that they could utilize uh, gender and, and sex to their advantage because there was a real anxiety 
that women traveling on trains would be raped, would be mugged, something terrible would happen to them because they're now traveling unaccompanied, you know, across vast distances. And so they created these, you know, gender segregated cars or sex, sex segregated cars. And so women flocked to them. So black women were like, I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. And Ida B. Wells was trying to, you know, utilize that um, to her, you know, to her benefit. And, you know, a train conductor was like, no, you're black. And right. suddenly, you know, sex and race pull apart right. in this really powerful way. Right. And in your book, you talk about the question about, say, you know, in, in literary representations, where do Chinese people sit when they travel on the railroad? Right, and right. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. That yeah. was so interesting to me. Yeah, so the question, I mean, segregation, like railroad travel, like particularly in the American South, which was segregated by mm -hmm. Jim Crow. Um, so I talk about a little bit about this in the book as well, because it's not just about Chinese Americans, it's also about African-American right. experiences riding the train, Native American experiences. Um, but uh, Jim Crow was, was basically its origins, legally speaking, was on a train, was on an interstate train um, out of New Orleans. And the Supreme Court case, Bussey versus Ferguson, which declared segregation constitutional in 1896 was about train travel, black train travel. Um, but because of the way, so, you know, Asians traveling in the US in the segregated South, um, I talk about this in my first book, actually, there's a Chinese diplomat, Wu Ting Fang, um, who was traveling through DC, which was, you know, segregated. And he actually has a moment in his memoir um, in which he's trying to sort of, you know, extol the virtues of a US Chinese relationship, mm -hmm. right? That the Chinese are not America's enemy, right? This is in the 19 teens. Um, has this moment on a train station where he's like, I don't know where I need to travel. Am I colored or am I white? Um, and so this is something um, I think that happened very frequently, like it was very localized, right? Um, but the way in which um, Jim Crow operates, it's, it's, you know, a huge, it's a, it's a spatializing project, right? It's about saying certain bodies don't belong in certain kinds of spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and black bodies in particular are the most circumscribed in terms of the spaces that they can legitimately occupy, right? Um, and we see it, you know, in terms of the anti-Black violence we see today, like African-American people going about their business essentially and being killed, right? Um, because, oh, they may be in their apartment, they may be in their car, they may be going to the local convenience store, but something about them was not in the right place. So they represent a threat. Um, and so in terms, like in terms of thinking about the triangulation of race, right? Where Asians fit into that, I mean, that that's a huge part of like yeah. of what the train represented yeah. um, in those days. So those are still issues that are alive today. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing in the past about that. It, it's true. And what I it, it, what really interests me also about the train as this kind of space that forced all of these different kind of racial reckonings and self awareness mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. that to a certain extent, there were different types of racist infrastructures that got utilized uh, or weaponized against each other. So right. we're talking about the black and Chinese and white triangulation, right. where it's right. like if, if blackness is blackness and whiteness are the two racial formulations that um, sort of animate what an American identity is or is not, right. where Chinese people or native people fit, right. you know, or Irish people. That right. was something that also I was interested in with, you know, writing West, mm -hmm. which is thinking about the polyvocality um, and the polycultural experience of that railroad and how even within the native experience, you know, we might have this idea, which is not incorrect, which is the transcontinental was devastating for native American communities. Yes. And it's generally true, but it's also true that certain intertribal conflicts, mm -hmm. um, the US military was able to weaponize those for its own benefit to protect the transcontinentals. So yeah. they were like, we know the Sioux and the Pawnee hate each other. Right. So let's hire the Pawnee as scouts right. to ensure that the Sioux can't attack the line. Right, right. Um, and the Shoshone seemed very willing, um, for instance, to give up their land, which they were not, mm -hmm. but they were driven out by the Mormons. But, uh, you know, we can treat, you make a treaty with them and say, if you stay away from, you know, the railroad, you can have train riding privileges, which they wouldn't give to other Native Americans, right, right. but then they would force them to ride on the tops of trains. Right. So each different um, tribal you know, entity had its own relationship with the train. The Comanche 
um, interestingly, you know, we're very successful in driving back mm -hmm. quite a lot of um, Western, you know, manifest destiny settler colonialism. Um, and they were really, they were, a lot of people who were working on trains were terrified of right. what they represented. Right. Um, but, you know, other things, you know, smallpox <laughs> right. did a lot of damage. And so, you know, obviously the train was able to go forward. But I was yeah. thinking about the ways in which, um, when we're talking about the train and, and race, and we're thinking about these different identities, we're thinking about how each identity sort of refracts. That's right. And amplifies something else mm -hmm. about a different identity as they come into contact mm -hmm. with each other mm -hmm. and to conflict with each other. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why it's such an, you know, the railroad is always kind of constantly ever present right. and ever being built. Right. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, were there stories that you kind of unearthed in your research mm -hmm. that? interested you the most that, that directed your research sorry can I, oh yeah no sorry i just realized because i am so familiar with your works and i'm realizing we probably should give cool. the audience a little bit of an intro of each of your works you mean of the the of west and and mm -hmm. okay oh so yeah I'm, I'm just gonna so <laughs> well, well i was gonna ask a question about talk it. about it <laughs> So I just wanted to read from Julia your just very briefly yeah. a paragraph from your introduction that I think encapsulates. I'm sorry, I'm feeling a coughing jag kick in, so I'm sucking on a Starburst. <laughs> Starburst, um, which also means the audio quality might not be very good. Apologies. Um, and I am not checking email. I am live tweeting in case anyone's wondering why my <laughs> laptop is open. Okay. So this is from Julia Lee's. Um, racial railroad the racial railroad looks at the train as a technology a symbol a space and a memory all of which produced this country's sense of itself as a nation enabled it to provide an alibi for its imperial and settler power and divided those within its borders into citizen foreigner and other the underlying assumption of the racial railroad so essentially so for any students and graduate students in the room. This is this is the argument. This is the intellectual <laughs> intervention. Um, the underlying assumption of the racial railroad is that the railroad reflected and contributed to a political system that depended on the exploitation of the environment and the exclusion of various communities, while at the same time acting as a powerful expression and representation of resistance and disruption. The contradiction that I allude to at this book start, which can be summarized by the statement that the railroad is everywhere, even though it is nowhere, is the launching point for an examination of the role of the train in the imagination of the American mind. Hmm. And would it be best for us to just show? Yeah, do you want me to go up there and sort of walk people yeah. through the project? Yeah. Or Diamond, yeah, yeah I think just, Diamond may be able to pull it up. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to sit over here while she's doing that. I want to watch. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, you notice that we have two ASL interpreters. I don't know their names, but I'm going to thank them. So thank, thank you. So when I was asked to write a poem about the transcontinental, um, the first thing I thought about was how am I going to do that? Long story short, I had been reading these poems that have been carved into the walls of Angel mm. Island Immigration Station. Those of you who do not know Angel Island, it was the Ellis Island of the West. It was where Chinese migrants were detained uh, while they were awaiting to come into the country. I see the building of the transcontinental as a paired event. There, um, during the building of the transcontinental, the Central Pacific eagerly recruited Chinese to work on the railroad. Um, they assume about 90% of the workforce was Chinese. They didn't keep exact numbers, so that would have been anywhere between 10 to 15,000. Um, and no one knows how many workers died building the railroad. It was the most dangerous stretch of the railroad to build because they had to blast through the Sierras. Uh, many of them blasting through the Sierras um, using very, very volatile nitroglycerin died. <laughs> but they didn't keep good records, the Central Pacific. Anyway, so. The Chinese worked on the Central Pacific Line, and as soon as the first transcontinental was completed, suddenly Chinese labor was a, a great threat. 
actually technically it was always perceived as a great threat to working class white Americans, but it became more of an imminent threat once the transcontinental was completed and the very powerful people who were running the railroad who were oftentimes senators and governors now had the ability to keep Chinese out. So 13 years after the transcontinental is completed, Chinese exclusion goes into national legal effect. That act stays in, in place until 1943. Um, my family, who's Chinese American side, was very much impacted by that. I think a lot of Chinese American families on the West Coast could have a story about their family that kind of runs through Chinese exclusion. So I saw these as paired historical events. And interestingly, there were two paired poems in Angel Island um, carved into the walls by either two different or one uh, anonymous Chinese detainee. And these two poems written in regulated verse, it's closest equivalent in English as the sonnet. These two poems elegize a detainee who committed suicide. I only translate one of these poems. I'll play you the first video. Um, and you'll hear what I wanted to do is create a sort of an immediate tension between this most iconic photograph of the railroad taken by Andrew J. Russell, East and West Lang Last Rail, or also the Champagne photo. I wanted to include all of the voices or as many voices as possible of the people who either built or were displaced by the railroad or continued to build the railroad. Hastui a dot at a penan linda. Tendo for Jago singam. Then he must be vates to train with me. Stay to train with me, vates. Pukavaleva, what I start to say. This is the sound of a train, no podem. Mamma de no, a carician, I stop it on us. Tendo for Jago singam, quinan, cotton, last passes. This is the sound of a train. No viajamos en el tren. Esto es mi hijo, en los trenes. We do not ride on the railroad. The railroad rides on us. We do not ride on the railroad. Okay, and now you go to the poem itself. Every one of those characters or pairs of characters opens up into a poem about the transcontinental railroad. Um, it's either in the voice of a transcontinental worker or it's a uh, oral history archive, it's a letter, it's an imagined poem, the video poems. These are, I will play one poem based on what you want to hear, but this is the list of topics that the poem itself includes and I'm not gonna get them all because there's like 30 of them adoption, African-American porters, the great migration, Chinese death rituals, hobos, Hollywood, Chinese immigration, immigration law, um, working men's party, presidential impeachment, pornography, polygamy, Mormons, Native Americans, the Plains Indian War. Um, let me see, oh, cholera, uh, mass murder, uh, in genocide, with all the fun stuff. Um, biracial 19th century journalists. Um, there's so many other things. But anyway, if there's something that I said that you wanna hear, I'll play one video just so you can see it and then I'll walk away. Is there something I said that would be interesting for you? Miss Home. Okay, yes, let me play this for you. And I'll put on the closed captioning. I just realized I can do that. It's more effective. Miss Home. Ways to die. Blasting accident, derailment, boiler crack. Crushed between trains crossing in the night. Electrocution, bad food, heart attack. You can work yourself to death, a la John, a la Henry, or you can stay at home and die anyway. Fist and noose club gun knife in the back, gossip, sharecropping, bottle of rum with gas-soaked rag. What is freedom but the power to choose where you won't die? What is a train but the self once yoked to terror loosed into a force that glides on heat and steam? You're so far from Mississippi, the UP boss said when we hit Rock Springs. Don't you miss your home? 
Miss home, I told him. I'm hoping to miss it entirely. All right, I don't know why the volume is low on this, but each video comes with a note in the book. And I'll just read this one note and you'll get a sense of the project as a whole. The, vote, the note only appears, the notes only appear in the book that's coming out in May. Miss Home, I pick up my life and take it with me uh, and I put it any place that is not Dixie, wrote Langston Hughes in his 1949 poem, One Way Ticket. Hughes's poem is about the great migration that occurred between 1916 and 1970, in which poor and economic conditions, racial segregation and violence led to the Northern migration of around 7 million African-Americans. Prior to 1916, more than 90% of African-Americans in the US lived in the South. After the great migration, nearly half the same population lived in the North and West. The train facilitated the great migration as well as provided job opportunities, leading to a relative population explosion of blacks across the West. Rock Springs, Wyoming, for example, was home to the state's largest black population due to the town's coal mining industry, which served the Union Pacific. During the late 19th century, the Union Pacific Coal Company operated dozens of mines across Southeast Wyoming, solidifying its position through wage competition it created by pitting its workers against each other. Black coal miners specifically were brought in as strike breakers. The train, however, was not the only draw west. In 1908, Charles and Rosetta Spies, along with three of Charles's brothers, settled an entirely black farming community called Empire in Wyoming near the Nebraskan border. At its peak, Empire housed 65 black farming families, a church and a schoolhouse. It also endured five lynch lynchings. The most galvanizing occurred in 1913 when baseman Taylor, a man taken into medical custody as family's bequest on account of psychosis, was unduly restrained by the white Goshen County Sheriff, causing head trauma and seizures. Taylor was then taken to a hotel in lieu of any established jail in the new county where he was shackled to a bed, burned, choked, and beaten in full view of other prisoners and hotel guests. He died three days later. By 1920, the community of 65 families of, had dwindled to 23 residents. The community collapsed in 1930. Such lynchings occurred across the state and other racial lines. On September 2nd, 1885, white miners in Rock Springs, enraged by the Union Pacific Coal Company's preferential hiring of Chinese who were paid less for their work, murdered 28 Chinese miners and injured 15 others, burning their homes and driving the rest out into the desert. Called the Rock Springs Massacre, these murders were part of a wave of anti-Chinese violence across the West, many of which can claim their origins in the Wyoming riot. X marks the spot. Langston Hughes' poem is in part about escape, in part about work, in part about the search for a home that has never existed in America. Rock Springs' African-American population has significantly dwindled since the late 19th century, declining soon after the Union Pacific began fueling its locomotives, not with coal, but diesel. So you get a sense of like how the project kind of works. So Paisley, I don't know if you're gonna remember your question mm. to Julia that I interrupted, but-, but That's don't. okay because I actually, I, I really wanted to ask mm. you about this, the polyvocality element mm -hmm. and that video where you hear voices saying. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really interesting because that image is supposedly one of the most famous images, photographic images in 19th century America, the champagne photo, but it's, people often talk about the optics, right? That there's yeah. no Chinese yeah. worker in the photograph, but your decision to have an audio component, to yeah. have voices, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's the great thing about working with um, video and the digital is that it houses other ways to make meaning. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something really telling about looking at a photo of all of these white guys yeah. And then hearing all of these voices that are going to signal any, you know, a, a wide variety of identities and right. realizing, oh, who's left out of that photo. Right, right. Um, and audio was also a great way of thinking about making connections that the poems themselves verbally don't have to or not at that moment interested in making. So the Civil War is a major part of the transcontinental's history, its mm -hmm. purpose, its you know, the making of it itself. And so um, we used the sound of hammering that turns also into the sound of gunfire and that turns back into the sound of hammering in mm -hmm. certain videos mm -hmm. to sort of break, um, to, to draw that story again, closer into focus that a lot of these Union Pacific workers were um, ex-soldiers from the right. Civil War right. who were out there 
Um, and, you know, Lincoln's own idea of the transcontinental was that that was partly a military project, mm -hmm. which was the next war would start with Utah. Mm -hmm. um, the next war would be in the West because that's where the Mormons were gathering. It was a very strange and secretive, you know, a uh, group of, of individual, you know, people marked by polygamy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just was so interested in the ways that transcontinental, that work can, can signal this kind of Marshall project, mm -hmm. but that can be, you know, uplifted by sound mm -hmm. um, as well. And so for me, uh, I, I didn't realize like how useful it was as kind of yeah. technology. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, particularly the juxtaposition of those voices and different yeah. languages and that image, I think, is really striking. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but the other the other question I have because I've also written on Angel Island, yeah, and um, I I am really struck by your use of that of the elegy to as an entry point to think about the railroad. Yeah. Um. So if you could just say more on that because I think that's incredible actually that you are linking up these historical like historical events. I mean, Angel Island itself, of course is primarily known as the, you know, for Chinese migration, right? Yeah. Um, but also Chinese detention. Exactly. Um, Chinese imprisonment. Yeah. Um, and similarly was nearly destroyed, yeah. right? It's only because of a because, random yeah. random park ranger. Who, who saw the poems. Who saw the poems yeah. and it was it was slated for demolition. Yeah. I don't think, is it a national park? It is, is a national park. It is a yeah. national park at mm -hmm. this point. So if you could just say something about that too, that was that was Yeah, I've got a couple of things to think about. I mean, I started thinking very much about what an elegy is because, mm -hmm. you know, both our projects in some ways are taking a very, um, if we think about the ways that the transcontinental has largely been written about and thought about, it's mm -hmm. like this triumphal kind of event. Yes. It's all about progress. It's all about completion. It's all right. about sort of like, you know, futurity yeah. and modernity and right. the nation. Right. So taking an elegiac approach, which I think both of our projects yeah. do, yeah. the idea that the transcontinental is essentially leading to various kinds of failures. I'd love for you to talk about how you see it yeah, yeah. as a failure too right. in a minute. Um, so there is something elegiac in, in nature about the project, but I was thinking about what is the elegy doing mm -hmm. as a genre or a mm -hmm. mode, I should mm -hmm. say, a mode in poetry. Mm -hmm. And one way to read it, and I talk about this in the book, is sort of like you could think of it as a form of almost pathological mourning, the mm -hmm. inability to give up the subject, yeah. um, to release it into memory. Right. But the other thing that struck me was, and this comes up a footnote that I read, and I'm, I'm going to take a tangent, and I swear to God, I'll get back. One of the questions I had was sort of like, if there's a triangulation between white, black, and Asian, mm -hmm was there triangulation between native and Chinese and white? Mm. And so I found myself asking like, what did the Chinese think of the native workers and the native people that they ran across? Mm -hmm. And there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of scholarship about right. that, but there was really interesting Paiute and Ute oral histories right. that would talk, and Shoshone histories that would talk about like Chinese men marrying into or being adopted into these tribes. Right. And there's this wonderful story, um, whether it's true or not, of, of a Chinese, former worker um, who had memorized the stories of the Ute, mm -hmm. uh, all of these stories. Mm -hmm. And when he died, 60 Ute and Paiute elders came to mourn him at the mm -hmm. Cheyenne Indian right. Agent Station. Right. And I was really struck by the idea that elegy, when cross-culturally and polyvocally shared, becomes a sort of testimony of endurance. Mm -hmm. And it becomes not a pathological mourning but a constant call to memory mm -hmm. and reenactment of memory. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, I think we're in a moment where we want people to remember their own stories. Right. But there is something really powerful about the kind of appropriative um, thing of, of remembering other people's memories, mm -hmm. putting people's language and putting people's testimony into contact with mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. as a way of sort of sharing what they had in common. Because mm -hmm. that was the thing that really struck me about the transcontinental and the building was that so many of these people were taken advantage of because they refused to see cultural similarities and right. were encouraged not to right? because it served white supremacist right. interest. Yeah. Um, but had they had moments of cult, you know, common right. cause, they would have been far more effective right. in lobbying for things. Right. So that's that's something that I was thinking about with elegy. Like yeah. how do we think about elegy as not a moment of sorrow, but a kind of re-engagement with a larger community. Yeah. That's really, I mean, because I I there's a Iris Chang's um, The Chinese in America. Mm. Um, she talks about the transcontinental railroad as um, a grave, she says, yeah. because 
she estimates that for every like four miles of track, two Chinese laborers died. Like the number, you know, we don't know exactly don't the know. number of fatalities. We'll never know. But if you think, and that, you know, Chinese railroad workers would, would set up cairns where they buried um, those who had died so that their bones could be retrieved to be sent right. back to China. So thinking about um, the railroad as a kind of, as a tomb, right, mm -hmm. as a marker, um, and it's a marker of absence because we yeah. don't know anything about the lives of the men that died in those instances, yeah. right? We don't even know their names in yeah. those instances. So um, thinking of it that way, like, because exactly as you're saying, the impulse is to talk about it in triumphal terms it, within Asian American studies itself as yeah. well, which is understandable, right? Like yeah. this kind of like Asian Americans, Chinese Americans have been here since the 19th century. They they helped build one of the, the largest infrastructure projects in the nation's history. So this explains like why Chinese should be included. Um, but I talk about this in the book, it's a version of model minority politics. Like yeah. we're the good immigrants, the Chinese are the good immigrants. So they should be considered American for that yeah. reason. Um, but I think thinking about it in this elegiac way as a, as a grave, I think is really. Well, but also, and we should talk a little bit about Chinese death rituals in a minute too, because mm -hmm. that's some fascinating stuff. But, mm -hmm. um, but I want to also point something out or return to something you were saying there about um, polyvocality then and the grave and also thinking about it, if we reimagine the American West as China, settled by Chinese, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Settled by African Americans. Mm -hmm. Settled by you know a lot of other migrant groups that were not considered white. Right. It's no longer a white triumphal manifest right. destiny story. Right. But the flip side of that is then, of course, we're part of settler colonialism. That's right. That's you know, right. like it's no longer about oh, these are the good Chinese. Mm -hmm. You know, and and they were only exploited. Mm -hmm. Do they actually end up participating mm -hmm. in a form of exploitation too? Mm -hmm. I remember having a um, conversation with um, a Chinese American businessman who was utterly dismissive of some of the ways that Chinese, there's a lot of Chinese American scholars and, and trained enthusiasts mm -hmm. who are horrified by the fact that no Chinese are represented in that famous champagne photo. Right. And he, he was so, sort of like so dismissive. He was like, but they didn't invent anything. They didn't make anything. Their no. labor was for other people. Right. And I was like, that was such an unusual right. kind of, but his, this idea of ownership it matters more than almost anything else. And I was like, ownership and the idea of being at the top of the heap, the right, you right. know, like being the one known for your innovation is exactly right. the thing that kind of leads to all of this loss. That's right. Um, and I'm just kind of curious, I want to go back to a question we were starting to talk about with failure mm -hmm. um, and some of the texts that you were writing about and some mm -hmm. of the things. What are some of the failures that you see as the preeminent ones mm -hmm. for the transcontinental? Well, we talked a little bit about yeah. this at lunch, but um, Richard White, who's a Stanford historian, has written, oh God, I can't remember the title now. Railroaded. Railroaded, yeah. thank you. <laughs> God. I was like, it's a play on railroad. I know like yeah. the puns are inevitable when you're working on this material. Um, but he talks about, and I, I cite this, and I, I, I would you know, cite this in the book and argue from this perspective. Um, he says the railroad was by and large a failure, like by every yeah. metric. Um, it was a giveaway, it enriched, a couple, like yeah. a very small number of, of men who then went on to found many of the cultural institutions of the West, like Stanford mm -hmm. University or the Huntington Library and Gardens. Um, and um, that, but, but basically it um, ruined most of the, you know, the settlers who came in um, and that it ended up being an environmental disaster as yeah. well, extraction economies. And of course it, it, um, decimated native mm -hmm. tribes, yeah. um, which is kind of the point of the railroad to begin with. Yeah. But um, but yeah, but so thinking about it, you know, in that way, and it's interesting because he draws a parallel between the railroad of the, I might think it's Alan Trachtenberg in the Incorporation of America, I can't remember. One of them says the railroad in the 19th century is the internet of the 21st century. Yeah. Like the people talk about it in this kind of hyperbolic way as like, trans and it is transformative. Yeah. It transforms how we think about time, how we think about space. Like we expect things instantaneously. It changes now. our notion of community. It changes you know, our course, notion. Yeah. And culture. Like yeah. suddenly you can share things that before they had an East Coast culture or West Coast culture. That's right. Now everything is shared. Is, is yeah. all the same. And so, you know, but that kind of, exceptionalist rhetoric like yeah. this is our this is the solution now to every problem that we have um and it it never was yeah. it, it never was and so part of what's so in the book I talk 
almost exclusively about Asian American, African American, Native American artists and writers um, who use the railroad, right? Who wanna focus on kind of those issues around the railroad. Um, so they're not feeding, I mean, they're not by and large feeding into that kind of exceptionalist right. rhetoric, um, even as they're using it as, a, as, I, as Jen said in, in her, when she read the, the summary, they're using it as a way of disrupting the, the kinds of yeah. ways in which they're excluded or, or um, in which their bodies are you know, ex excluded or written out of history, et cetera, so. I would say that there's a way in which, I wanna go back to the thing of absence. You know, yeah. We're talking about if the transcontinental is a series of graves or just itself a grave because there's so much absence built into yeah. the railroad's narrative. Um, we don't know how many Chinese worked on the railroad. Right. We don't know, there's a great quote that sort of says any number of Indians too working yeah. on the railroad. No one knows who was working on the railroad. We don't know these people's names, stories. Um, and in, in the case of a lot of the Chinese workers, you know, you made reference to the fact that there are graves where I live in Utah, you can drive out to the, the dead transcontinental line around mm -hmm. before the loosened cutoff goes through this Great Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. There's all these you know, ghost towns and there are grave markers and you don't know if those bones are there because a lot of the Chinese saw themselves as sojourners. They did not want to be buried and left in American soil. They want soil, they wanted to go back home. So they would pay a district association to dig up their bones after a certain number of months, scrape off the flesh, you know, break the bones up and send them back to China. There's a really interesting um, artist named Summer Mailing uh, Lee who discovered that many of these boxes are, have been deposited in the Tonghua Mortuary Hospital um, and have just been left there. They were never picked up. Mm. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, we haven't found any letters. We haven't found any diary entries. We have very few photos of the Chinese workers. Right. And we have very, you know, the same thing for almost all of those workers along right. the line. Right. And that is a loss, but I have to say it also feeds into a kind of um, formal disruption if you're an artist. Yeah. That loss is actually a kind of gain for you as an artist where you're like, now I have to figure out you know, how to tell a story yeah. in which that archival evidence is incomplete. That's right. And how, and the only way you can do that is through a form of hybridity, which That's is right. to say, I don't have this, but I have the, the, the Paiute oral testimony. Right. I don't have that, but then I've got this oral archive of black porters working in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. How do I triangulate mm -hmm. to get a picture of that? For me also, like, I took very seriously Richard White's thing about the yeah. internet, you yeah. know, because I was like, that's why I wanted it to be a digital project. Right, right. And it's also why I chose the colors I did. Right. A white screen burns a lot of energy, but a black screen does not. Right. So I really was thinking about, you know, the you know, internet is not free no. and, it, and it's not environmentally clean. Right. So I recognize that in fact, and the thing about the web, if you create a website, it degrades, the code degrades, you have to constantly rebuild it, mm -hmm. which is my own sort of private, like, Talking to the transcontinental, because the, the thing about, you know, you talk to transcontinental workers and they're right. like, as soon as you're done building it, you have to rebuild oh, it because the track yeah. constantly degrades. Right, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, when I'm thinking about like, because there is, Jennifer mentioned, like I'm interested right now in um, the ne Asian American neo frontier narrative and that in the last 10 years, there have been several, yeah. uh, mostly novels, but um, short stories, literary fiction written by Chinese, mostly Chinese American, but but others as well, who are looking back at the 19th century and the spaces of the American frontier. So not necessarily the railroad, but um, the West. Mm -hmm. And you know, it isn't. And I talk about this in the in the book when I talk about Maxine Hong Kingston and when I talk about Frank Chin and how they talk about the railroad. Mm -hmm. um, they you know, it is this idea of how do you relate to history when the experiences of your community are not deemed worthy of memorialization, yeah. right? So what is your relationship to history when there is no history or when that history is so obliterated or never, it was never even taken down. It wasn't yeah. like they wrote it and then decided to destroy it. It was just never written. Um, and I think that's part of what is sort of, I think for a lot of literary folks like yeah. yourself, right? That you have to honor that history, but at the same time, you have to acknowledge the fact that you're building off of 
very little like, yeah. and it's mostly absence it's mostly the form of what was there before what i found myself doing was going to 19th century etiquette guidebooks and phrase books oh, so there's three poems on the website that specifically take from chinese phrase books from the 19th and early 20th century and it was because if you don't have those letters you actually do understand what happened to them because they did leave a record of what they expected mm -hmm. would happen to them mm -hmm. so there's whole things like dealing with the law and it's like um, that is the man who stole my, you know, suitcase. That is the man who cut my head. Mm -hmm. That is the person who who took my mind from me. That is the person. That person committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Like these are common phrases. Like that's the the title of the the guidebook is mm -hmm. like you know ordinary situations for you know Cantonese speakers. Oh my goodness, and that's it's horrible when you yeah. think about that. And so I I have those things, and you know, I, I even sort of create a persona uh -huh. for one person. Um, my name is Ah Kwong. I worked for Mrs. Black on 10th Street for 10 years. Uh -huh. I can bring you good references. I mean, these are phrases that they would have memorized right. coming into the country. Right. And so I was thinking of these phrase books as like in the absence, again, of these individual testimonies, right. you've got right. this communal relationship and, right. um, and a community narrative. And it was funny to me um, thinking about my own grandfather coming into the country right. who had to rely on some of these phrase books or you know iterations of them. And right. I, I have a question in my my notes, I said, you know, do you become the person that has to use the phrase book right. or does the phrase book actually anticipate you? Right. And I think it's a little bit of both. Right. You know, it's, it's anyway, I was kind of haunted by that. Yeah. So like, but I, I think that that absence allows, like I said before, for kind of interdisciplinary, but also create creative um, conversation about how do we find voices or how do we create a voice out of that nothingness? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, thinking about, and I say Kingston does this, Chin does this, using the railroad. I talk about the railroad as a memoir, like essentially yeah. seeing, trying to see the message that, that their ancestors, have, in Kingston case, her grandfather, right, might have left her, like in yeah. the railroad yeah. as a transcontinental worker. And, um, you know, thinking of the railroad as text, like yeah. if we think of it as a, as a way of communicating that is outside of kind of, Bellatristic notions of the literary or about circulation, you know, all of those things. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just really struck by the kind of the way in which I see that as well in. Well, she was a big influence on me. So no, I was okay, really okay, excited okay, reading okay, okay. her chapter. <laughs> it's like, yeah, she was really helpful to right. me because, you know, the liberties that she was taking yeah. with that imagination. And, That's right. And she's, as a formal writer, she's yeah. always been somebody who interested me. Like right. the woman warrior was just, I'd never seen anything like right. that done. Right. And right. so... You know, I feel like I'm going back to Lisa Lowe's kind of yeah. work, but I just that's the thing that has always interested me so much about Asian American literature mm -hmm. is that it's always been sort of transnational. It's always been yeah. sort of hybrid at its very root because right. you're always thinking about another way to tell that story, right? Uh, another language, right. another voice uh, that, and an alternate history that is always dogging you. Mm -hmm. And then I don't see that as, like I said before, I'm just sort of beating this over. It's it's not necessarily an absence of a perfect memorialization. It's mm -hmm. just a refractory kind of yeah. memorialization yeah. that mm -hmm. becomes so exciting. Um, that's, that's why I like the idea of, again, a website where you can go and click and you find right, right. something and you create your own translation of this. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so... Should we take questions from the audience? Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, I mean, I think this is a perfect kind of spot to pause also because it's 425 and oh, yeah. I, technically speaking, my class ends at 425. So I do understand <laughs> some of my students may want to leave. If you can stay, there it would goes. be great. Okay. Um, but we did have three pre-submitted questions and I'm happy, of course, to come around and pass the mic to people if you have a live question. Um, I'm going to start with um, the one that I think is unanswerable in case there's somebody because and I and by the way, I'm not doing this to embarrass anyone who is the questioner, but it is honestly the kind of question where I thought, I don't think there's an answer mm -hmm. given how large, mm -hmm. but maybe there's an expert in the room who can help us. So mm -hmm. this is the question that was pre-submitted. What is the relationship between the 19th century and 21st century trade and race issues involving China, Korea, Japan, Russia, Vietnam, and the United States? So if anyone has a familiarity uh -huh. of 19th century economics, 
and trade and race, and 21st century economics and trade and race involving China, Korea, Japan, Russia, Vietnam, and the United States, we welcome you to share your thoughts. Oh, would you like to answer? I uh, don't have an answer. That's my <laughs> question. Um, so uh, really, I'm working on a case involving the Northern Pacific Railroad and a railroad bridge, uh, the, the last major part of the Northern Pacific that was, the, the, the railroad you're talking about was an 1862 act. 18, mm -hmm. The Northern Pacific was an 1864 act. And um, that, that uh, railroad connected the Great Lakes, Duluth, with uh, the, the Portland Pacific ports and the ports by Seattle. And, uh, and that's uh, a railroad that is, is very, uh, took a lot longer to build. This was a seven, the 62 railroad was finished in 69 in Utah. And hmm. a second railroad was begun in 1864, ran through bankruptcies and other things. Uh, and was finished in 1883 when this bridge that I'm involved in uh, helping a, a private group uh, try and save, uh, still in use, has been in use since 1883 mm -hmm. without really any changes to it. Uh, it's an amazing uh, piece of architecture and uh, engineering. But but uh, the, the, the thing that is happening, this, this railroad bridge has been used primarily for coal uh, for the last 20 or 30 years, hauling it from the Powder River Basin to um, to the uh, power plants uh, near the Miss Mississippi and farther east that uh, instead of burning high sulfur coal, they used low sulfur coal and they didn't have to put on pollution controls was the main, main reason that so much of this coal was shipped. Uh, but right now what's happening is that coal trade is shutting down uh, the Pacific Rim is supposed to be the dominant mm -hmm. rim uh, of, of trade in the world uh, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And you still have those parts of that, that, some of the underlying parts of culture and racism that you're talking about, that's, st that's still present. Mm -hmm. And my question is basically, how can you tie those two things? And the railroad itself is being... Um, very secretly, but is being uh, re, uh, re, rebuilt to uh, handle that trade, including they, they want to tear down this bridge so they can put up a two track bridge where it's going to be easier to get goods faster instead mm -hmm. of still focusing on the coal trade. Mm -hmm. So so I, I don't want to, that, and that's the kind of background of the question, but it really is some of the same things that happened in the 19th century are happening now yeah. in, yeah. in our culture. And I that was really the core of my question. And, it was very general and broad, but I, I didn't, that's where it came from. Yeah. I don't think I can answer the question maybe, but I, 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 I appreciate like kind of what you're saying because the transcontinental was built not only to unify the nation, but also with an eye towards trade in the Pacific and towards exactly. Asia, right? Exactly. So the idea was, um, you know, to speed up the ability to, to produce um, goods and then ship it across you know, the country and then ship it over to Asia or vice versa, right? Um, and so the idea, the idea is exactly the same, right? That the train um, will cement kind of US economic interests, particularly in the Pacific. Yeah. Um, and so I think you're, you're absolutely right to see that connection between those things. I think what's interesting, at least, in, and I don't know very much about this, but train travel is not a very efficient way to like move goods across the country. I mean, this is because the transcontinental was built with that in mind, but then the Panama Canal was completed. Yeah. And basically like any, you know, that's why the railroads went bust after mm -hmm. like they, they overbuilt. And by the 1880s, like there were way too many, there was not enough things to do. And that's when passenger travel took over. And that's when we have the kind of tourism. US record, yeah, tourism yeah. come into play. Um, and so, you know, as someone who's written about the railroad, I'm often very skeptical about the way people talk about it as yeah. a kind of, as a as a kind of, in this kind of structural way for this infrastructural way, um, just because we already have a long history of it not doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? right? Um, and then, 
I don't know anything about this case in particular, but it sounds very similar. Like there are echoes of yeah. that um, in, in what you're describing, so. Yeah, I was saying this to Julie's class earlier, which is I was really struck by how during that the contentious last presidential election, they would go back to sort of high speed railways oh, and yeah. the fantasy of the railway and the yeah. railroad itself is like this um, image of American modernity and image of American sort of global trade superiority and uh, you know, that, that that we keep going back to it. So there is that real carryover from the 19th century, which is like, we're going to, we're going to keep doing, <laughs> making these sorts Same of, um, you know, metaphoric bids for uh, cultural dominance and stuff like that by using the railroad. And, and, you know, as Julia pointed out, and it's really true, you know, that uh, if anything, the railroads have turned us more insular, it didn't actually facilitate that, that, that trade to China in the ways that we had hoped, but it did sort of produce a sort of national culture um, in, in ways, and it also bankrupted lots and lots and lots of people. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I can't answer that question either, but I think one of the things that really struck me when doing the research for West was just how much so many of the anxieties of the late 19th century are our contemporary anxieties and that the railroad still kind of bubbles up at the heart of some of these things. Like what is it to be um, an, a modern nation that is so racially diverse with the history of slavery that we're still wrestling with? What does it mean to live through a pandemic? I mean, they had a cholera, they had many multiple cholera um, epidemics that were facilitated by the transcontinental and railway travel. Um, they had, you know, lots of, you know, railroad caused depressions, um, high inflation, you know, wage, you know, lots of strikes, labor strikes, um, lots of, you know, anxieties about race, lynchings, you know, proliferated along with the Jim Crow lines. And so, yeah, um, to write about that, there was a presidential impeachment. I mean, mm. you can't, you can't even, it was, it was fascinating to think about how to write from a historical perspective is to write about now and then to write about now is to sort of send us right back. There's something very spirally about the whole notion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for contextualizing your question mm -hmm. for us. Um, okay, on the note of race, uh, how do the issues of race that were part of Civil War legislation mm. in 1862 and 1864 that allowed the construction of the Union Pacific and um, this person is writing Northern, but I think they mean Southern Pacific Transcontinental Railroads carry over into the near monopolies that BNSF oh and Union Pacific Railroads <laughs> have over trail traffic, rail traffic serving the Western ports that dominate Pacific Rim international trade in the 21st century. Yeah. That's all you, baby. <laughs> Well, I don't know, no, again, I don't know that I can answer this question, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, this is what Paisley and I were talking about, this kind of the idea of the railroad as being, you know, a, a symbol of American modernity, American exceptionalism, American success, um, but the reality of the, the transcontinental in particular was it really just enriched a few people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it was always monopolistic. Um, and so the the idea the monopolies about the B I think that's the um Burlington right the Burlington and Santa Fe I'm not sure what the N means Northern Northern Burlington Northern, Northern and Santa Fe um and the Union Pacific Railroads that that is just I mean that again is like a, I think a carryover from the 19th century like it it really is kind of amazing yeah. the way it's like cyclical it doesn't it doesn't change like we look yeah. to the railroad for the same sorts of things as they did in the 19th century the questions are a little bit different or the 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 kind of issues are different but it's ultimately like oh the, my last chapter my code is called the train will not save us yeah and that is really you know because over the course of the last two centuries the analog for the train might be the internet or you know whatever green technology whatever I'm like, that's not going to change yeah. like the basic problems that these things represent. Yeah, um, because they represent the desire, I mean, uh, uh, empire, yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. They're empire yeah. building technologies, both yeah. of them in yeah. some ways. Yeah. I, you know, one thing, I don't know, I'm just going to take a stab at this because I have no idea. So I'm just going to go in any old direction and maybe something will be interesting to you. But um, two things really strike me about when I was doing the research in the 1862, 1864 Rail Acts, they couldn't have been more explicit 
uh, in those railway acts by sort of saying like, the grant is Native American lands and we are basically giving them to the railroads. You have right away, you know, to do whatever you need to protect that line, to take ownership of that space. So it really facilitated um, the removal and the genocide of, of Native American nations, basically. And to a certain extent that, going back to this idea of like, cycling back through time, that is true even today, which is, um, I interviewed a lot of people who are freight hoppers or hobos, you know, mm. they used to call them the 1920s, but people who are riding the rails illegally, and they talk very much about this idea of that the, the Wild West remains the place around any tra track because railroads, because they're private companies have been given this incredible power by those two railroad acts. Um, they own this, a lot of land on either side of the tracks. And if you cross into that space, you're sort of leaving your legal protection and entering this, this basic like free for all space. And so, you know, women freight hoppers were talk, talking about like they were terrified of the bulls, the people who were, you know, making sure that these places were, you know, safe for the railroads. Um, they were afraid of getting raped because they, you know, that could have happened there. One guy was almost murdered. He was beaten so badly. Um, and, you know, La Havre right now in Montana is one of the most violent yards in America. And they talk about, um, you know, these different yards have different, you know, sort of like rules effectively because they're owned by different companies. And so you think about the ways in which some of these railroad acts facilitated different kinds and types of violence that continue on today, because this is, privately owned land mm -hmm. um, and that the government essentially kind of just gave them. And that's really astonishing if you think about it. It's it's terrifying mm -hmm. to think that you're entering a separate legal space as soon as you walk onto a train yard. Um, yeah. So this, I'm actually gonna fold in my own question into this last mm -hmm. question. Um, because, so I'm gonna read the question. What was the recruitment process for Chinese workers? Mm -hmm. How did they get to California? How many stayed? Oh. And, and the question really is, when did you first learn that Chinese had anything to do with building the railroad? The railroad. Yeah. Mm. Because I, if I, you know, and, and I say this when I give presentations that I didn't get any Asian American history in my K through 12 yeah. life. Um, and that the, but that there was one line in the, in the history textbook that was used my junior year of high school. Um, and it was that the Chinese helped build the railroad. Mm -hmm. That was what, like, so one line in history book, that was what Asians got, right? We helped build, even Japanese American incarceration wasn't even talked right. about. Yeah. I knew about Japanese American incarceration because I had friends whose parents or grandparents had been incarcerated mm -hmm. in concentration camps during World War II. Mm -hmm. So I knew about it through right. family and friend connection. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, the question, which is a great question, you know, also strikes me about that we don't get enough ethnic American history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sure. that's true. That's true. So I guess just to repeat, do you know what the recruitment process was like? For I actually do know the answer to this because yeah. I did some research about oh, this sure. yeah. on my first yeah. book. Yeah. Do you know what the recruitment process is like? How did they get to California? How many stayed? I don't know. So you need to. I know. <laughs> so <laughs> I should um, know this, but I don't. Actually. So Strobridge. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Strobridge. Yeah. Strowbridge. Yeah. That yeah. Guy. So it's <laughs> my understanding um, is that they initially had Irish um, laborers yes. for the Southern Pacific and Central Pacific. Central Pacific. Central yeah. Pacific yeah. Sorry, Central Pacific, and that a lot. One of the things that would that would happen, and again, this sort of plays into stereotypes of Irish American people. But in one of the books I read um, when I was doing my research. Uh, they said, you know, Irish workers would come, they would get a paycheck and then they would like quit. Yeah. Like they would go to bars and they would quit. And so they were having a hard time getting okay. a stable labor force. Yeah. And Strobridge had heard about Chinese, like railroad projects in China. Mm -hmm. And so he decided he, there was a trial basis in which he had, you know, he brought over about 50 Chinese laborers, mm -hmm. tried them out realize that, okay, this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And then they advertise, they advertise in Hong Kong yeah. for Chinese laborers. Mm -hmm. um, and so they recruit, and so they came over by boat. Yeah. That was the main, like that was, there's no plane. So they right. came over by, by steamship right. to California. Right. And by that time, cause this is also after the wave of, you know, men coming around the country for the, um, discovery of gold, right. um, you know, there's all, you know, there's lots of ships and steamers right. coming from all over the Pacific and, you know, the Atlantic and figuring out a way to get to California. 
Um, and in terms of how many state, like the, in terms of how many state, I don't know. I don't know a number. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. They, but because such poor records were kept and because a lot of, I mean, so Salt Lake, you know, a lot of those railroad workers kind of became other, you know, they became shopkeepers, they became, you know, um, gardeners, farmers, you know, they, they entered into a completely different economic system afterwards and then they migrated too. So mm -hmm. it's really hard to tell. And sometimes they went back and then came back again, right? Like if they could. So it's really tough to know, but you know, here's another kind of story that I thought was fascinating was like um, the Bingkong Tong. Um, so Tongs, if you don't know them, they're sort of like benevolent societies. They're all male benevolent societies. But in the 19th century, they were also a kind of mafia. They were a way of providing legal and social protection for Chinese migrants, pretty much only male migrants at that time because they were trafficking Chinese women into the country. But they were there and designed to be police because they wouldn't be protected by police. Mm -hmm. And um, for the New York Times, I was asked to do um, a report on, on Chinatown and Salt Lake. And I got involved with the Bing Kong Tong, which is a 19th century transcontinental holdover oh, wow. um, because they came over. They were a warrior Tong, which is to say they were sent east to, along a transcontinental line to secure the territory for the Chinese workers they thought were going to stay and um, settle down. So they they brought in, you know, groceries, opium, women, um, they trafficked all of that. And what's interesting about that now is um, there's, we have such a different wave of Chinese immigration to the country, like the Bing Kong Tong is now dying out because the people coming from China, especially into the West, tend to be Mandarin speakers, right. well-educated, right. and they're coming for tech jobs and right. universities. Right. And so these Tongs, these transcontinental holdover communities are also sort of like, right. you know, just dissolving and becoming a different type of, you know, they're like, we're, we're getting erased culturally. Right, right. <laughs> um, so, but it is a great question, like um, how many stayed, do you know? I mean, the census records indicate that there were never more than 100,000 Chinese yeah. at the most. At the most yeah. And this would have been later in the century. So after the completion of the railroad. So, you know, leaving would have been extraordinarily difficult because um, there's no guarantee that you would they get back, come back in. in and, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the idea of the sojourner society was really prevalent, but at the same time, I don't know how many people were going back, especially yeah. after Chinese exclusion passed in 1882. Right. Um, you know, the first time I learned about the Chinese and the railroad was way later than you. I read Chinamen. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't read Chinamen until graduate school. Oh, wow. So I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Okay. I mean, I, I honestly have no memory of ever hearing anything about it prior to that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Kingston's book. And, you know, she wrote Chinamen with like a chronology because she was assuming her readership would, would not, not know, know anything. anything. She was right. She was right. I mean, you know, so I, that was my first exposure to the fact that the mm. Chinese had built the railroad. So you, I you got over through a work of literature. Yeah. That's really, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. history through literature. Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly. Sorry, Paisley. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I knew about it as a kind of cultural fact, but I don't think anyone gave me a, 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 list, a lesson. You know, for me, writing this project is so sort of like, steeping myself in the history that I was never taught, mm. you know, um, in general. Yeah. Julie, did you, yeah. I was just, I have a comment, I have a question. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering about the relationship between the uh, Chinese labor and the labor movement. Yeah, and close. since, yeah. um, I guess, you know, a lot of the big strikes of the 19th century, the mid 19th and later 19th century are railroad strikes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I have always assumed without knowing for sure, that the Chinese workers were not unionized. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. that would have had everything to do with why they didn't like the Irish. Right, <laughs> and the Irish hated them. I have a video actually <laughs> about uh, the Working Men's Party in California and Dennis Carney. And yeah. the Chinese were central to unions, but not because they were included in unions. They were central, I would say, in the sense of the figure of terror. Right. Like right. in some ways, the presence of Chinese allowed for so many different different white ethnic groups to suddenly declare themselves as white. I was reading these um, speeches that were coming out of the Working Men's Party and they were saying things like, I came here as English, you came here as Scottish, da 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 da, da but here we're white. Right. And I was so interested in that and it was triangulated very much around 
um, the fact that we're just not Chinese, nor are we slaves. Right. So blackness and Asianness became central to sort of reframing the ways in which all these different other white groups that would have been seen, seen as somehow fringe white groups were now white working men mm -hmm. and they would not compete. This is a direct quote with the mechanics of the market. And that always interested me, the ways in which um, if there was a kind of metaphor attached to Asian bodies, it was one of mechanization. So deeply inhuman that they were part of the railroad itself. Right. Um, yeah. And the ways in which um, those unions then sort of that rhetoric going back to like now kind of echoes into so many of the sort of like we will not be uh, replaced you will not replace this kind of stuff mm -hmm. so that the labor unions definitely utilized the specter of the chinese mm -hmm. uh, that's what i would say mm -hmm. i mean yeah you, that, that, i think that's right on yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah and i guess I, I meant when i said they didn't like the the irish i meant the the railroad bosses didn't like the Irish workers. Yeah. They, you know, yeah. that the, the yeah. text that you were referencing, well, they would drink every time. Yeah. They yeah. were also in the union and they were striking. So yeah. that yeah. might've been a reason yeah. why. And it uh, was interesting when you think about the difference, you know, the Irish and the Chinese at different points in times went on their own strikes, right. but they would never strike together. together. Um, in part because the Chinese did look down on the Irish and the Irish didn't want anything to do with the Chinese. And also there was a language barrier. Um, and also the Irish did get better treatment. Yeah. They got, you know, they, they didn't get very much pay, but they got housing paid for for free and the Chinese didn't. And they, the Chinese labor, the Chinese working day was not um, set. Mm -hmm. um, so they could work, you know, 12, 15 hours a day. And they right. were just like, we want to have set working hours right. and they wouldn't give it to them. Alexander Saxton, the historian, talks about how Chinese labor on the railroad, they were paid about two thirds what their yeah. white counterparts were paid. Yeah. Um, and they were doing the most dangerous, the most dangerous, the work. most dangerous work, working with nitroglycerin and yeah. explosives and laying tracks. So um, there was, yeah. And it, it partly the reason why um, the Irish workers allowed Chinese workers to come on in 1865 mm. was because the Central Pacific told them you will be our conductors, yeah. like you will be our engineers. We will not, none of, very few of the Chinese, I don't think any of the Chinese railroad yeah. workers were hired after the completion of the railroad to fulfill those more visible and yeah. kind of more prestigious roles. So it was a kind of agreement um, between the Central Pacific and the and the workers. And what's also interesting going off of that, you, you think about the ways in which slave labor um, and slavery in general also haunts the railroad in so many yeah. ways. like the racial pattern of employment in, in the railroad to hire black porters uh, and brakemen and, and you know, engineers, the, the difficult physical, but also potentially lethal jobs, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes um, was based on the fact that the Southern railroads were entirely built by slaves. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the biggest slaveholders down South tended to be railroad companies that would rent out from other plantations, these um, slaves that they would work them um on the railroad so they built basically almost nine thousand miles of track and they only had specific jobs um building and and facilitating certain things in the railroad so that after slavery ended and suddenly you know there's free movement they still only hired in these sorts of jobs so right mix that yeah, yeah. Pullman reporters can i just also mention that um there were I think seven or eight ballot initiatives nationwide for different states to abolish slavery Oh, and this, yeah. I think I think there oh, were eight. Seven passed. The oh. one that didn't pass was in Louisiana. Huh. And very specifically, Louisiana didn't want to pass a law abolishing slavery okay. because they recognized that under the 14th Amendment, they could use prisoners right. and mm. compel them to work. Right. And yeah. they didn't want to give up the ability to have Louisiana incarcerated yeah. prisoners mm -hmm to be in do forced labor. Mm -hmm. That's I'm, talking right now. I'm talking yeah, about right, right, right now. now. I'm talking about in the 21st century, in right. the year 2022, right. the citizens of Louisiana had a chance to abolish right. slavery and no longer compel prisoners into forced labor situation. And they chose not to. Right. Yeah. yeah. So none of this, right? So in, you know, in terms of this gentleman's question about links between the 19th and 21st century, um, there's still a whole we lot of stuff going, going on. <laughs> we just yeah. keep going back. Yeah. Other questions for our distinguished guests? Yeah. 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 Let me give you the mic. Thank you. 
Thank you. Everything I know about this subject comes from reading the Stephen Ambrose book. Yeah, uh, so if my understanding sounds kind of narrow, that that uh, blame it on blame it on him. But uh, what, one of the one of the, the uh, one of his descriptions of, of that whole process of building the railroad was that the Chinese workers had skills that nobody else did. Right. Or they would do things that nobody else wanted to, like dangle over the side yeah, of clips right. in baskets, planting dynamite dynamite charges, right. and and also that they're that they're that they they uh, had the ability to to work as teams as teamwork right. that other yeah. that other nationalities and other groups didn't have right. and perhaps this is a naive question but i i couldn't figure out i mean i, I was puzzled why th those skills that were so that were really crucial to getting that that whole railroad built over the mountains mm -hmm. di didn't translate into or didn't uh, didn't enable that didn't give those Chinese groups any political power. Mm. Uh, they weren't they 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 weren't they weren't embraced by. And it seems like it would have made a sense for the for the for the uh, the leadership of of, the, of this project mm -hmm. to embrace those people with those skills and be able to get things done right. and bring them into 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 the leadership yeah. uh, ideally. And that just never happened. At least uh, at least. I don't think it did from reading the Ambrose book. No, no, because is that any like? Can you shed any light on that, no, or is that a I mean, the Central Pacific, um, in particular? That's the, the there was the Union Pacific that was building westward, and the Central Pacific was building eastward. The Central Pacific was like chronically short of money. Like they never, they just never had funds. Like it was under, like they were undermanned, um, underfinanced, and so they were under real financial pressure, basically, to keep costs down. So the Chinese represent, they were cheaper labor. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we have to remember is they're building through some of the remote, most remote parts of the country. And the Chinese are, set, all the railroad workers are setting up these labor camps adjacent to the tracks. They're relying on the, on the railroad company to provide food, food to provide like uh, tents to provide yeah. blankets, like all of these things that are essential, they have to go to the company store to purchase that. So um, it's not like they could go you know, into town to get these things. And so um, even though they were you know, highly prized workers for these skills that they had, um, they, were, they were really, vulnerable. yeah, they, yeah. Were, they were in a terribly vulnerable position. Um, and if they lost their jobs, they, there was no, you know, it's not like they could ride the rails back, like they were stuck where they were. Um, and so the conditions were such that basically, um, they did strike, yeah. uh, they did strike frequently, um, but they didn't, I mean, you know, sometimes they got a reduction in hours or a slight increase in salary, but we're not, not we're not, much. yeah, we're not talking about like um, huge gains. Yeah. From the they Central were starved Pacific. out. I mean, they were Charles stopped. Crocker, right. who was in the Central Pacific, who was like overseeing this would just essentially say, cut off their food supplies. That's right. That's and so if they would, so that's why trade with Native Americans became so important. Some of the archaeological remains in these sites are fascinating because yeah. they sort of indicate what Chinese workers were eating and they right. found, you know, porcupine bones and things like, like that. So they were, you know, at some mm. point they were trying to figure out other ways of surviving outside of what they would be, you know, able to get yeah. via Crocker and stuff like that. Yeah. I would love if if we could do archaeological like kind of excavation of yeah. of the rail of railroad sites because they come across things all the time. There's yeah. nothing ever anything sustained or anything, but the things that they find, you know, um, in Utah and yeah. and um, are just really fascinating. They do give us kind of a glimpse of what everyday life might have been like for the average Chinese railroad worker, but. Yeah. Um, I have two poems about archaeological artifacts. Okay, okay. Actually, but yeah, you can find them on the site. Yeah. One, one is the what you could have found in Leland Stanford's mansion after the 1906 earthquake, oh. and the other one is what you could find in a Chinese camp in Terrace, Utah. Right, right. So, yeah, they're not similar. No, but I mean that, that is something that I feel like you know states or universities could get involved. In. Well, so um, we are out of time, but I will say this. So I. Um, two summers ago was driving through Montana and Wyoming, you know, visiting national parks as one does. And on the way back, actually inspired by uh, Julia uh, Shizu Papa, I'm a PhD student here in ethnic studies. We, my husband and I stopped at Rock Springs, Wyoming. And what we just, what we found out is that there actually is an archeological dig mm -hmm. happening in Rock Springs, Wyoming mm -hmm. at the, the site of the Chinese camp. Mm. Um, and that they are trying to excavate mm -hmm. and get a glimpse of exactly what 
you were sharing about, right, Julia. Right, like, right. what is the everyday life of Chinese laborers? Right. What was it like? Right. Um, you know, since the time of the massacre. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is that even though there was this massacre that drove out, you know, and and killed so many Chinese in Rock Springs, Wyoming, they were brought back in. Yeah. yeah. So the, the Chinese laborers in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in the mine actually didn't disappear after the massacre, which is what I assumed. Mm-hmm. Um, there was police presence that were brought back in. And it may, I think maybe even the state of Wyoming mm-hmm. brought in because, because again, because of capital interest, because the, yeah. the interest of the mine owners mm-hmm. was such that they wanted and needed to have cheap labor. Yeah. And so they, they brought in um, maybe even the federal government. I can't, but they, they had soldiers camped out sure. in Rock Springs yeah. to mm-hmm. ensure the safety of the, of the of Chinese miners. Yeah. yeah. I would also say really quickly that the Chinese are obviously seen as capital, but you could say that about all of those workers. Right. There's a story that came out where they found 57 murdered Irish workers um, outside of a railroad in Pennsylvania. And the thought was the company, the railroad company basically allowed for and facilitated this murder because they, there was a fear of cholera. And rather than mm-hmm. more people getting cholera, they just killed these people that right. were their own railroad workers and then dumped them in a mass grave. Right. So it's a fascinating kind of, you know, window into how these these bodies of labor were perceived as nothing more than sort of like capital. Right. It would be much more costly to somehow keep these, you know, these people and keep them well than to just kill them and get yeah. rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. So can we have a round of applause, either putting your hands together or um, for our our scholar artist guests for our ASL interpreters um, for the staff. I mean, I could not put on this event by myself by any stretch of the imagination. Dylan Carpenter, Megan King, Diamond Darling, Mariana Pereira Vieira. So, and Julie Carr, of course. Thank you, Tamar. We again takes a village to put on an event like this. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for wearing a mask. Stay warm. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.